Well, uh, let, let's get started with the second speaker. And I'll give a very brief introduction. Uh, this is, uh, as you can see, Susie is not here with us today. She, Susie, you're in Washington, right? Well, actually, I'm in Tallahassee, Florida today. OK. I wasn't sure. Yeah. <laughs> so um, and she has up on the first slide here, she has, she's between Tallahassee and Washington. Hmm, that's interesting between Tallahassee and, and Washington because she's just taken a new job. She is the Director of Online Strategies and Programs for EDUCAUSE. Um, I met Susie, again, I, I was saying that this is because of FIPSI money. I met Susie at uh, a FIPSI conference last year on, um, it was something called the Textbook Rental Initiative. And neither of us were very interested in textbook rentals, but we uh, proposed um, uh, two projects that were focused on open educational resources and open textbooks in particular. And at that time, she was the director of something called the Orange Grove, which is, Flor as she has here on the first slide, Florida's digital repository for open textbooks. And I was incredibly impressed by the work that she was doing by the breadth and the, the it was just, it, it, I haven't seen anything uh, quite like it. And uh, so we, we uh, recognized each other as kindred spirits and she was also an excellent speaker. So I'm very happy to have her uh, talk to us today about open textbooks. So Susie, you ready? I am ready. Okay, so take it away. Oh, thanks so much, Carl. I, to all of you, I'm very sorry I couldn't be there, but uh, next week, EDUCAUSE is having its annual conference, and 6,000 of our closest friends will be joining <laughs> us in Philadelphia. So needless to say, I have a lot to do this week. But I, I didn't want to pass up this opportunity to join you, even remotely, to talk about something that I am very passionate about. Uh, Carl's very passionate about it, and I think that's why we wound up being kindred spirits at the FIPSI meeting. So I want to take you through a lot of territory this morning. and. Um, but feel free to interrupt me, ask questions. I want this to be interactive, if you want it to be interactive. And um, so let's, let's get started. Uh, it's, it's a very exciting area. Uh, just this morning, I got a new uh, uh, article sent to me from the Chronicle about Sigil, which is a uh, new ebook publishing software that's out there where people can publish things to iPads and different things. So every day there's something new happening. But let's start looking at the basics here. And um, again, feel free to interrupt me if you have questions. All right, I don't know how new open textbooks are. Let, and let me just ask a, a question here. How many have used open textbooks? Carl, can you just take a poll with hands there and then just let me know? Uh, I would say 10% of the room, or n not a very large number. Okay, that falls just in line with some research I'll show you later on. So, all right, so open textbooks have different definitions depending on whether you are a student or if you're from administration or faculty. So let's first take a look at the open textbook definition that the Student Public Interest Research Group provides. So as you can see from looking at this, I'm not going to read it to you, but free and cost, modest cost, those are the priorities for the students. And um, it's important that they can be read online, self-printed, or downloaded you know, via a computer with internet access. But their major focus is on cost. But there's something missing from this definition. So if we look at what the community is defining as open textbooks, here it is. Freely available through an open license. Here we are talking about copyright, which is so incredibly important. It's the copyright that gives you, the user, the faculty member, the permissions to do these things, to read, download, copy, distribute, self-print, search, or link to the full text without financial, legal, or technical barriers. This is critical for the success of any kind of open educational resources. And what's also important is that the author, the person who's paid for the, the, um, the resource to be developed, gets to set 
the permissions for this. And they range, as we'll see in just a second. When you're looking at Creative Commons, there are two basic conditions. And the first one is that you must always provide attribution to the authors. And then the second is that uh, you don't use it for commercial purposes. Now, you can allow others to use that textbook commercially, but for the most part, in the optional conditions, you have to copy and distribute the textbook. Um, those, you, well, I'll let you read the optional conditions over there. That's what you can do in the six different licenses through Creative Commons. Any questions here? If you haven't looked at Creative Commons... Can, Common, can I interrupt for just a second? Yes. Um, I want to make sure that everybody knows we have a brochure that's put out by Creative Commons. We downloaded the PDF for everybody. So make sure that you pick one of these up. It's right outside the door. It's called The Power of Open. And Susie was just talking about the licenses. Uh, in one of the first pages, it gives documentation of all the different kinds of, of licenses because it's not one size fits all. The whole point is that you can adapt it to the different kinds of open educational resources. Absolutely. And that's what's so important because when you talk to faculty, if they've developed something, you know, they may not want to give it away or they may say, I don't care how it's used. So the fact is that everyone has choice. So when we look at open textbook priorities, for us, these, it boiled down to these three priorities. It's got to be accessible to everyone, to faculty, to students uh, from anywhere. It's got to be adaptable. And it's got to be affordable. Now I'm going to show you, let's hope this works. I'm going to show you a little video that we developed. We received the Newton uh, Award for Innovation uh, two weeks ago for our Orange Grove Text Plus project. And I think this will get you a lot of information in a very short period of time. The high cost of textbooks negatively impacts the ability of the United States to educate students. In Florida and elsewhere, many college students pay more for their textbooks than they pay for their tuition and fees, especially for those majoring in science, technology, engineering, and math. On average, a post-secondary student paid $1,137 for textbooks during the 2010-2011 academic year at a four-year public college. Since 1994, the cost of textbooks has risen at nearly four times the rate of inflation. For some students, textbook costs become the tipping point between going to college and not being able to afford to go to college. In a survey of over 14,000 Florida students, 37.1% reported that they do not purchase the required instructional materials. Ultimately, the high cost of textbooks negatively impacts our national economy and global competitiveness. In response, a unique partnership between Florida's statewide Orange Grove Repository and the University Press of Florida has been established. The University Press of Florida provides the publisher skill set that ensures quality textbooks and an opportunity to purchase a commercial print edition at low cost. The Orange Grove Repository stores the textbook. This partnership is called Orange Grove Texts Plus. These textbooks are made available under a Creative Commons license. This means that anyone may freely download, print and use the textbooks, and in many cases, permission is given to revise, remix or redistribute the textbooks under the original terms of the license with attribution to the authors. In some cases, authors even give permission to make a new commercial work. Often, faculty work to improve and update the textbook each time they teach the course. Through Orange Grove Texts Plus, all students have access to their instructional materials in the format that they choose and on the device that they select from anywhere in the world. Students also benefit from a new partnership with WebAssign to provide interactive homework problems for some open textbooks with immediate feedback, links to the relevant sections of the textbook, and videos for just-in-time help. The cost savings are significant. For example, in one course at one university in just one year, students saved over $500,000. This same story can be repeated at other institutions as new textbooks are added and more faculty become informed about open access textbooks. 
Whether you are an on-campus student or a distance education student, when faculty use an open textbook, all students will have access to the instructional materials required for that class. By lowering textbook costs to students, the higher education dollar stretches further, allowing decreased educational costs, decreased student debt, and in some cases allowing students to take more classes and thus graduate sooner. Orange Grove Texts Plus moves traditional publishing into the digital age while allowing the student to select one or more ways to interact with their textbook. Orange Grove Texts Plus. So I hope that you uh, you gathered from this the impact that uh, open textbooks can have on a university, on a state, and on a nation. We have um, raised our costs to attend a university and get a four-year degree or a two-year degree or any kind of degree to the point that there are many students who cannot attend. And open textbooks is a solution to solve the high-tech cost of education. So I wanted to talk to you about what are the key pieces to have an open textbook initiative. And there, as you can see here, you need to have a repository or some place to store them so that they are accessible and people can discover them. We have partnered with the University Press of Florida, and I'll talk more about the value of that. It's, um, it's been an incredibly powerful relationship. You need to have uh, partners. You need, those partners might be other institutions, other states, but at least at the very bottom, you need to have authors and you need to have more books. And then WebAssign is an online homework service, so you need something like that. And I'll explain more about why that's important when I show you some data later on from the student uh, textbook survey that I did uh, a year ago. So moving on. Uh, I just wanted to encourage you to go and see this site if you want to. It's www.theorangegrove.org. And from here, you can access both the digital repository and the textbooks, which are stored in a collection within the Orange Grove. So if you see the red box on the right, just uh, click on Browse OGT Plus Books. That will get you to all of the ones for which there is a print book available as well. Or if you just want to enter in and see the, any of the books, you can click Enter Site. Uh, Orange Grove Text Plus was launched in September 2009, and it became a, a strong part of our FIPSI grant. Here's a look at what you'll see inside. All of these books are available to any of you at no cost. The only cost would be is if you choose or your student chooses to purchase a print edition. But I encourage you to go and take a look. We've included the K-12 open textbooks from uh, CK-12 as well, uh, which is a wonderful open textbook initiative from uh, Nira Kosla in California out of Silicon Valley. And then, as you can see here, the OGT Plus print on demand books, and then those that are supported by WebAssign. And then there's um, thousands from InTech, and those are very technical books. And I'm proud to say that we have a foreign language book from UT Austin. Yay, UT Austin. <laughs> so what does the Orange Grove provide? It is, it is the glue. It's, it provides that uh, persistent file storage and the URLs so that people can find content. We collect. Uh, standards-based metadata based on the LOM, learning object metadata. And that enables us to both be discoverable, but also to share our content effectively with others. We can be harvested. And uh, we can also do federation with other repositories. So when we look at the repository, it's, it's a vehicle for us to both share content with, uh, with our own people, but as as well share content with others across the United States or across the world. And it gives you that access to these books to download them, in many cases to purchase that commercial print copy. You can just link to the book if you want to on a web page within an LMS, or a student or a faculty member can self-print it. When we did a survey of faculty, they said that one of the ba major barriers to using open textbooks was that they, they couldn't find open textbooks consistently. 
So we feel that this is um, a very powerful solution. Now, the University Press of Florida brings the credibility of a publisher, and, and in fact, I highly recognize and regarded um, scholarship uh, dissemination for our state. And most states have a university press of some, of some type. When we partnered with UPF, uh, they put in place their acquisitions staff, their development staff, and their distribution staff. So we didn't have to provide all those publisher skill sets that are so critical for having a quality textbook. And again, if you look in the lower right-hand corner there, when we did a survey of faculty, the number one priority was quality. And are any of us surprised? Probably not. I, I would be surprised if quality was not the number one priority. So the University Press is just an incredibly valuable partner. The print-on-demand publisher uh, brings us the ability for students to get a commercial print um, copy. And it's low cost, and they can purchase it online just like you would from Amazon. It's printed one, on, you know, one at a time, but there's no, any, there's no order limits. And a quick turnaround and they have locations around the world. I think our first 10 books that were printed were uh, printed in India, and they were about an India Indian history course. And so I thought that was always kind of fun. But what we did discover was that when we did a survey of the students, 70% of them said, you know, I want to be able to purchase a commercial print edition. But in practice this year when we uh, offered an open textbook for a calculus course, only about 100 students bought a commercial print edition. Most of them either self-printed or they just downloaded it to their computers. So money becomes a critical uh, issue for the students. Now another piece that we need are, as I mentioned earlier, our authors. We have I think what's I would consider an amazing relationship with the provost at the University of Florida in Gainesville. He has put out money to support the development of open textbooks, and he hired the math department, and the math department hired Dr. Sergei Shabanov, who is a remarkable professor. As you can see, he's very distinguished and has been recognized by both his peers and by his students. And Sergey was able to develop an open textbook for calculus in six weeks, which is in a, a remarkable feat. Now, it's a PDF, but what he was able to do is to take the problem sets from a, uh, several open textbooks, and then he wrote what he felt was his uh, desired textbook called Concepts in Calculus because he thought in the United States we were not taking the appropriate approach to teaching calculus. So it was a remarkable feat that he was able to do this. And so we're grateful to both uh, the provost and to Sergey and all the authors. But that's a critical piece of this puzzle. So we do need this supply of high quality open textbooks wherever they come from. And I'll give you some ideas on how you can participate towards the end of this presentation. We need that team, and you can be part of the team. So, and however that team can be put together, whether it's a state, whether it's a nation, whether it's an institution, you cannot do this easily on your own. There are some authors who do it on their own, but it's not easy. The other piece of the puzzle that uh, is really important is the online homework service, particularly for the STEM courses. And I think it's appropriate, when we did this student survey, almost 90% of the students said that they need these online practice problems to improve their grades. And interestingly enough, WebAssign was started as a FIPSI grant out of Raleigh, North Carolina at uh, North Carolina State University. It was a physics professor who couldn't meet the needs of all his students. 
I think he was serving 1,500 students in a large lecture class and wanted to be able to provide individualized assistance. So he developed this online homework system, got a FIPSI grant, and now it is a commercial entity. It provides these automatically graded tracked assignments, different question types. They have what I would call a stable of about 60 programmers who do the algorithms to present every student with a different problem set so they can't copy each other's work. And um, then they also can provide links to the open textbook content, the video, the tutorials. And it offers instructors the ability to embed their own personal content. And I would suspect that there are things they would do for foreign language as well. They are very innovative, very willing to work with new uh, content areas. So those are the four major pieces that I see of to implement and establish an open textbook project. But what we can't forget about is who are the people who we have to consider, report to, who are our stakeholders? So I put together this chart for you, and let's take a look at who we considered our stakeholders. Trust me, this has uh, greatly expanded <laughs> since uh, we started looking at uh, repositories and open textbooks. So in the first row, the red are the primary stakeholders, and not surprisingly, students and their parents, um, faculty and staff and institutional leaders, I consider the primary stakeholders. If you have any other ideas, I would be welcome to those. And that's because they are directly impacted by both the cost and the quality of the open textbooks. Now, the other people who come into play here are Florida's higher education leaders. And why is that? Well, when you start trying to put together a budget, you try to start getting uh, state support, you must have their blessing. Without this group of individuals being willing to take your message to the legislature, to the governor, to all of the institutions and, and the, the deans, and you just look at the, the structure of an institution all the way down, it doesn't happen very effectively. So they may not be primary stakeholders, but they are absolutely critical. And when we started our open textbook initiative, well, actually, when I'm sorry, let me back up a second. When we started our repository project, we focused on our primary stakeholders, and we hadn't really thought we needed so much support from the green row there, but we soon recognized that we did. Now, if you look at the executive and the legislative leaders, these are people who are not intimately involved with uh, the day-to-day -day operations on a campus. And yet, when they make a decision, it has an impact that cascades throughout our state, and I suspect your states as well. So it's really important that they're informed and that they see support for open textbooks. If you're going after uh, the governor's support or you're going after legislative support for funding. Not as important, but but can also be a critical piece here are the citizens, because if, if we have a more informed citizenry, they will support the initiatives of open textbooks, and they become parents, and they become grandparents of students at institutions. And they can also impact our, our education leaders and the legislative leaders as well. You never know when one of them might become a, an advocate for open textbooks or open educational resources. So all of these people are really critical and there's, you have to be able to have a message that targets each of them. Are there any questions about this or any suggestions? I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. What about the textbook? What about the textbook industry? Oh, thanks, Carl. Well, hmm. Thanks, Hans. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I didn't put that in there. And um, because we were thinking more about open textbooks. 
and we don't necessarily need them, but we'd certainly be willing to partner with them. So maybe that's something we need to add in there. Thanks, good point. Uh, we have had conversations with them, but at the end of the day, the challenge was that they wanted to restrict access to content that they had developed. And so when we looked at the model you know, of including publisher textbook material, we weren't quite sure how that would work. So I think they're going to have to work on their model in order to fit into ours. But the good news is that we are significantly having an impact on the publishers because um, they're realizing that the model that they have right now is not going to work, and I think they're, re re they're rethinking it. Any other questions? OK. Well, we'll we move. One more oh, question. Yes, OK. Yeah, um, we have a question about tenure and promotion, the effect of, of, of open textbooks, the production of these kinds of materials on, a, on a, a faculty member's tenure and promotion. Oh, we're going to get to that. That is, uh, he's right on. That's just a, a huge issue that we're beginning to deal with, but it's, it's so important. So tell him to save that thought, and we'll get to there in just a bit, okay? Are we ready to move on, do you think? Um, one more question. Yeah. OK. Um, in language, the uh, textbook is actually not as important as the multimedia. The fact is, maybe the era of the textbook is gone. OK, so we have a question about the nature of the textbook or definition of a textbook, because in foreign languages, multimedia, the additional components are actually more important than the print, printed textbook, the, traditional, well, the concept of the traditional textbook. Oh, I think you're right, especially for foreign languages. Um, well, the, all of that could be stored in a repository and shared. And, um, and I, I think you're absolutely right. The definition of what a book is or a textbook or what the n required instructional resources are to support foreign languages has really significantly changed and probably f for the best. Having been a French minor in college, I remember how I just wish we could have had a real person there talking to us or, you know. So, um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. The, the value of a textbook has really changed. But you could amass, you could store those resources in a repository and then put them together into a digital textbook, which I think would be most powerful. And I should probably send you a link to that Chronicle article where um, they were talking about this EPUB uh, software where you could put together very quickly a an ebook with um, all the digital resources and publish it yourself. So I can send you that at the end, but that that I think would be really helpful for all of you in in foreign languages. I think you could be on well on your way very quickly. Anything else? OK, all right, we'll move on. OK, I thought this might be a little interesting to you all, because some of you may be faculty, you may be administrators. But we did a survey. I was looking at um, open access textbooks, because we had some legislation in Florida to uh, recommend some policies. And so I'm one who I like to hear from who it's going to impact before we make any legislative recommendations. So we conducted this study of faculty, and you can see it was a uh, majority of the respondents were university, and m m most of them were faculty, and about almost 10% were administrators overall. Not surprisingly, in terms of textbooks, uh, at the universities, the faculty member has the major decision and the department at the college level. And when I talk about colleges, these are community colleges who are now, um, majority of them have a few four-year degrees that they're offering. This I thought was pretty interesting, and I thought this reflects perhaps what, uh, when you raised your hands earlier in the presentation, um, when we asked if you're using open textbooks, uh, this reflects uh, probably what you're seeing in the room there as well. Uh, 
we found that one of the barriers to using open textbooks or even open educational resources is that over half of them, if you look here um, under all institutions, 52.1% of them ha didn't have a clue as to what open textbooks were. And that number was just slightly less at colleges. But overall, you know, when you look down here under very familiar with open textbooks, there were only 197 or 7.3% overall that knew anything about it. So what this tells me is that in terms of open educational resources and open textbooks, we have a long ways to go to educate people. And I think a lot of traction has been made since the fall of 2009 when we conducted this survey. So in terms of who had ever even used any kind of open access materials, it was you know hovering around uh, 11 to 13 percent. And most of them had only used supplementary materials. But interestingly, most administrators reported higher rates of the use of um, open access materials. Uh, here is a ranking of the factors that would influence the faculty member's decision to use open access materials. And I'm going to just run through this real quick. So you can see bookstore is uh, on the very low end. And time. Time was very important, knowledge about. And then here's the academic quality. The majority all felt that academic quality was so important. And that's why we found it so important to partner with the University Press of Florida because they brought instant credibility with their publisher set skills and their ability to review for quality. Here we go, tenure and promotion. This was identified as probably the most major faculty barrier to develop open educational materials because it's new and the decisions for tenure and promotion are often at the department level and the people who are making those decisions don't know a lot about open access materials. They don't maybe haven't used them and um, so as you can see here the, the highest percentage of, um, of open access materials considered for uh, tenure and promotion are the peer-reviewed journal articles. But almost 41% in the first bullet there just don't consider open access materials in determining promotion and tenure. And then a few consider open educational materials. But I hope that will change. And I think it will as more and more people start to consider the value of these resources and start to use them in their classrooms. But do you, do you all have any ideas on how to change this? I mean, this is a huge culture change. Right. The, the, the points raised that it's not just about open textbooks, it's about textbooks. So it's about ah. ped pedagogical materials in yeah. general. And a related issue then is peer-reviewed journals, but sh um, uh, the idea of e-journals. Right. 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 Um, Oh boy, we've opened up a can of worms. So we're now oh, we're discussing we about the, <laughs> the very nature of tenure and whether it's real or not. Mm -hmm. So a comment was made that even with textbooks, we do need peer, a peer review process to vet quality. Right. right. I, I totally agree with you. And that is why the University Press of Florida brings the power of the peer review and has a, a skill set that really 
is valued by ten, promotion and tenure committees. Uh, there's Oops. one more comment. Okay. okay. Right. So, can you hear this comment? I can. Yes. Thank okay. you. But, okay. Uh, so, so I think all we're talking about in terms of open source is a delivery vehicle, not the core problem of the quality thing. Yeah. It's not a question. It's just. <laughs> it's a comment. Right. Okay, well, any other comments about this? Or we could discuss this more at the end if we have some time. Yeah, yeah, this let's, is... let's keep going. Okay, here we go. Okay, so just I just want to run through this real quick, too, because I, a lot of people have seen this data and thought it was very powerful. Uh, we did a survey of students because, as I said, I really like to talk about um, what it is that they need because we're trying to provide um, a resource for for what we think are their needs. So I thought it was incredibly important that we hear from them. I think the big thing was out of these 14,000 plus students is that they wanted choice as to how they interacted with their instructional materials. And that probably gets back to how they learn best. And here's where they said they wanted that opportunity to buy a print textbook. That's probably just their learned behavior and what they're used to using. But in terms of their behavior, as I pointed out earlier, they were not buying the, um, the print textbook, which caused a problem for us in terms of sustainability. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Here's some other, just we asked them, how do you reduce your textbook costs? What are you doing? And as you can see, most of them had to do with print books, buying new or used, buying used copies, selling used books, sharing books. But all of this had to do with a print textbook. Um, some of them rented. Um, there weren't very many using an e-version because they're still quite expensive in relation to buying a print textbook and selling it back. Uh, we did ask what are the most important features of a digital or an e-textbook, and I thought this was quite telling. Search, obviously, was the most important. Uh, one of the things they said is they didn't like the e-textbooks from the publishers because they lose access to those textbooks after about 180 days in most instances. They wanted the ability to self-print sections of them at least, or the, possibly the whole book, and if it's... um. They liked the open textbook because of that. Highlighting, uh, they wanted a commercial book. They wanted the ability to copy and paste and add notes. Uh, one of the problems with the publisher ebooks is that when they add notes to an e textbook, those notes are stored on the publisher's website and they disappear as well after 180 days. So there are some challenges that we still need to. Um, we need to solve if we're going to work with the publishers. But they like the open textbooks because they can add their own notes. They can, um, they can do a lot of these things. So right now, the open textbook, in, even in an e-version, is a preferred uh, way to interact with their materials. This was really interesting to me. We asked them, and I hope this is accurate, you know, accurate information, but the cost of a required textbook has caused me, a student, to, and look at the numbers for not registering for a course, because they're shopping around, they know what the cost of textbooks is. They're withdrawing from a course, look at that, the number is reported almost, a, you know, 10.5% are withdrawing from a course. And the numbers of failing a course, um, while they're not really high, the cost to a state, to an institution when someone fails a course, this is a huge number. And then if you look down here, uh, the numbers of students not purchasing a textbook or you know, frequently or occasionally is over half. So textbook cost has a major impact on students, on our economy, and our ability to educate our students. And here's where the students indicated what makes them successful. 
Uh, here are those practice questions like WebAssign that I pointed out earlier, uh, the PowerPoints that you all create, uh, the interactive activities, and videos. They love having your videos so that they can have their professor available on YouTube or on a DVD or whatever so that they can interact with you. Now we asked a question of the students, would you be willing to pay a small fee of five to ten dollars for every open textbook you use? And overwhelmingly they said yes. I think um, there were very few that weren't supportive of it. Only 10.9% said no. And in the maybes, if some of them said, well, I need to know a little bit more about it, but sure, it looks like a great thing to do. So what are the challenges here? Um, there are many challenges because we are changing the paradigm of textbooks. We're changing in some ways what a textbook is, how it's delivered, and um, so let's take a look at some of those. The sustainability model is, is huge. Open textbooks are maybe billed as free, but they're, are not, they are not free, really, because there are some costs to sustain them, you know, to pay faculties, uh, members, um, salaries to develop open textbooks, to work with the presses, to have a quality book, so we came up with an idea of charging this fee for open textbooks when one is used in a, in a classroom. And right now, we're having a few problems because um, there's some questions as to whether we can charge that fee or not. Uh, the University of Florida is charging a fee because they have found a way to do that through the fee structure. The colleges that are the two-year colleges with some four-year degrees are not able to do that because they don't have the authorization to do it. So sustainability is really key here. There has to be some dollars, and you don't want them to be grant dollars because the grant dollars, after a while, they disappear, as Carl and I both know on our FIPSI grants. <laughs> they only last for so long. And we need to make this a long-term solution. So sustainability is uh, key. We need to have faculty incentives to develop and use. Uh, I think the University of Florida, again, has put together a great model for that, where the provost has showed his support and has hired departments to develop textbooks. We had a um, faculty member come to us and say, you know, my students in uh, theater appreciation have a $140 textbook. And I have 650 students, and I would like to reduce that cost. So he is currently developing an open textbook for theater appreciation. And so we're, we're starting to get people to come forward and offer to develop textbooks. We've got American history that's been developed at Florida International University. And I've got another solution for you that we'll talk about in just a minute. Um, we need that simple customization tool. The sig sigil that I mentioned in the Chronicle article sounds like it may be that customization tool that we need that works with EPUB. And um, so I think things are beginning to come down the pike that are technology that can provide that easy interface to customize and bring together all those open educational resources or publisher um, content if you had it and wanted to pay for that and put it together. And then we realized, you know, from the survey that we did, that we really have to do marketing and informing both our leadership and the faculty and the legislature. Um, that is absolutely key. And when you have a very small staff like we had, which was uh, two people and a part-time programmer, uh, plus the resources of the, the press, you know, that's, that's a little challenging to do. And here again is tenure and promotion. We've, that is an issue that is um, important. When I worked with the Florida State University Medical School, their comment was, you know, we'd be delighted to do this. We see the value of it, but we're still trying to get tenure. And maybe tenure will go away. I certainly hope not because I like the academic freedom that it supports. But we are where we are right now, and I still see that as a, as a, a barrier. So let's take a quick look at new directions. This, to me, is very exciting. Meredith Babb at the University Press put together a call to all the university presses 
throughout the United States and some foreign ones as well. And she has gotten commitments from these presses as well as it sounds like there may be some more coming down the pike. And we're looking for additional partners, but we have probably got, I, I guess we're gonna be about 23 university presses throughout the world that are committed to doing open educational uh, resources and textbooks for students. And so I think there is power in numbers. When I talked to Meredith the other day, who is the executive director of the University Press of Florida, she, I said, Meredith, what does it take, do you think, what's our one takeaway from what we've learned in the last two years? And her comment was, look, it takes a village to do this. And I said, really, just a village? And she said, oh, no, it takes, it takes, a, it takes a whole nation. It takes a whole large group of people to pull together to do this. And so we are looking for additional partners. We'd love for you to join us. But I would like to encourage you to become your own small group and work with university presses to create those digital resources and those e-textbooks because we know that that is the future. I wanted to share with you a comment from Eric Christensen, who's a good friend of mine and um, a very talented professor. He is convinced that uh, the future of the textbook includes open textbooks and e-textbooks and whatever kind of textbook works best for your students. He teaches physics. He's reduced the cost of his physics class from, I think, over $225 down to about $25 total. And that includes the lab book and the book. And he updates it every semester. And he's had tr tremendous success with his students. And more of his students become physics majors than they ever did. And more of his students are successful. So it's a very interesting and new time in education, I think. So I wanted to encourage you to consider the future of the open textbook and your involvement in it. It's going to take every one of us to be a part of this, it, and it depends on you as well. So your involvement, your commitment, your leadership, and your creative support. So if you want more information, here's where you can go. I've had two FIPSI grants over the last uh, five years. The first one, Encore Blueprint, is about setting up repositories and it's lessons learned. The openaccesstextbooks.org is the one Carl referred to earlier. Our, <laughs> what would you say, Carl? They were supposed to be textbook, as you say, textbook rentals, but we were... Uh, we were little mavericks there and went off after something different. And that's where you can learn all our lessons learned about open access textbooks. I would encourage you to talk with Meredith Babb, who is the executive director of the University Press of Florida. If you want to become involved, um, she can help publish ebooks, print books, or a combination. She can bring you in contact with a university press that might be near you. And I'm always a resource as well. And um, so that's kind of what I have.